Got you, Lydia. <laughs> Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, my little marker is on page 310. When my husband and I were dating, we could talk for hours. Now we're married. We go out to dinner and have nothing to say. Did we talk about that one? I thought we did. What can a husband and wife do on page 311 to improve their communication skills if they have this classic problem? Why is he called a classic problem? probably have it. Did I mention the last time in class how women have a greater ability with talking skills than men do? So ladies, give us a break. Oh, I guess what we should say, Micah, is we need to step it up a notch, don't we? When it comes probably. to talking with the ladies, give them a little more information. Don't get right to the point. <laughs> Run around it three times. And embellish it a little bit. <laughs> they love the conversation. I don't know why. It's just the way it is. It's like, okay, so what does he say here? The solution requires compromise that should begin with the man. A newlywed husband had a specific responsibility to cheer up his wife, which he had taken. Deuteronomy 24. That's a cool verse to quote, isn't it? Are you cheering your wife up on a regular basis? Do you say things to cheer the ladies up? Do you say friendly things to them? I'm thinking that when you walk into class and I say, so how are things going? Okay, Micah goes, okay. But I think you ladies register that more vividly than the guys in the class do. Just because of the way you're wired. And it's like, hey, and that's important to do that. And do you know sometimes, oh, is this awful to say this? Sometimes I ask that question and I've got other things on my mind. And I'm not all that interested. But I'm interested in you, so I ask the question and then I force myself to listen. That's just what guys have to learn to do. Bottom of page uh, 311, my husband is somewhat insensitive to my needs, but I believe he's willing to do better if I can teach him how I'm different from him. And I'm thinking, I hate to say this to the ladies, but you're probably not going to teach him very much. <laughs> if he's going to learn something, it's going to be from another man telling him to be more sensitive to you rather than a woman telling him to be more sensitive to us women. He just needs that help from a man giving him some of that input. And while you're trying to teach him to do a better job of meeting your needs, what would you suggest that that lady do to make her husband a little more responsive. How about spending more time meeting his needs? It's, it's almost like if a marriage is going to work well, I'm thinking more about my wife's interests than my own, and she's thinking more about my interests than her own. You, you follow? It's like we're preferring each above ourselves. It's the principle that comes out of Scripture that we need to deal with. Page 316. Do you recommend premarital counseling for engaged couples? Do you guys think engaged couples ought to have premarital counseling? Why would I go see a counselor? I don't have a problem. Why would you have premarital counseling? To avoid some potential problems? To kind of get an idea of what kind of problems you might encounter down the road and what kind of things you're going to have to work through? And on page 317, he gives a bunch of questions that a competent counselor would ask. So, if you have some friends, got you, Hannah. If you have some friends who are getting married, probably one of the questions you ought to ask them is, 
have you scheduled some premarital counseling to make your marriage go better? And they go, why are you asking a question like that? He said, oh, I took human growth and development. And we talked about that. And they go, well, no, we don't think we need it. You might just open your book up to page 317 and say, well, let me ask you a few questions. In other words, I'm not a premarital counselor, but if I have a young couple getting married who are in my Sunday school class or who are friends of mine, and over at my house, and I and I find out they're not going to go see a premarital counseling, they're not going to do any premarital counseling stuff, I'm going to start asking questions like this. I'm just going to start taking some of these questions and saying, hey, have you guys thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And just get them to think about some of these things in advance so they're not completely surprised by it after they get married. Oh, no. We're in love. It'll all work out. Yes, it will if you stay in love, but there might be a few uh, adjustments to be made, a few rough patches along the way. Page 326. What's page 326 say? My wife and I sometimes get into fights. Fights? When neither of us really wants to argue. Oh, he calls an argument a fight. Is there a difference, Micah, between a fight and an argument? Yeah. If you and I are going to argue about something, we'll disagree and express our differences. If we're going to fight, see outside. Somebody, have to see outside. Somebody's <laughs> nose is going to bleed over this one, isn't it? <laughs> so, do you girls do you girls register that word fight like that too, or does fighting mean something less intense? I'm thinking that uh, if my wife and I don't agree on something, ah, did you see the way I said it? If we don't agree on something, we have a disagreement. Do we argue about it? Well, we don't need to. We can just each express our opinion and then decide what are we going to do about it. Maybe if we don't agree, we won't do anything at all. Maybe if we disagree about it, it might be that both of us need to think about it and pray about it for a while and then talk about it again in the future until we come to a place where there's a meeting of the minds. It doesn't mean that we both agree. It's just that we both agree to do or not do whatever it was we were discussing. Do you follow the rationale? So I don't like the word fight, and I don't like the word argue. I've never been in a fight with my wife, Micah, using our terms, <laughs> but I have been in an argument with her, and after it's done, I wish I wouldn't have done it. And somewhere, I read this in a book someplace, when I was studying argumentation and debate and all that kind of stuff, and I remember it vividly, because it said, a man convinced against his will, have any of you ever heard that, is of the same opinion still. So what does that mean? If I'm better at arguing than you are, if I'm a better debater than you are, I can win the debate, but I didn't change your mind. So I haven't really accomplished much. So it's just, I say, okay, we, we have a difference of opinion, a disagreement, but we don't have to argue about it. Let's pray about it. You pray for me that I won't do something wrong. I'll pray for you that you'll be more of a risk taker. I just make my wife nervous <laughs> with all these crazy ideas I have. And now she's reached a place, it used to scare her a lot, and now it's kind of cool. She goes, Tom, living with you is truly an adventure. And I thought, that's an interesting way to describe it, because I just do crazy things sometimes. I just think of something, and I think, wouldn't that be neat to do that? And she goes, uh, I don't know. I said, well, think. And see, I've learned to say, well, think about it and pray about it, and we'll talk about it again in a week or so, or a few days. Because sometimes that these crazy ideas I have, uh, in fact, if I think about it for a week, maybe I change my mind a week later, and she's probably praying, Lord, help him change his mind and see how crazy that idea is. But it's like we work things out. And you can do that 
if you're just willing to, and I think that word compromise is good, you make some compromises. We've spent our entire life doing Christmas her way because doing it the way I was, doing it the way she was raised to do it because doing it the way I was raised to do it just makes her so nervous. And it used to be early in our marriage when we would get in the car to go to Oklahoma to see my family, every time we went down there she would get a big fever blister on her lip. You know those kind that get a scab on them and break open and bleed when you smile? Any idea what causes those? Stress. Stress. That's exactly right. And we just learned that, that getting ready to go to Oklahoma was stressful for her because my family just stresses her out. Just the way we do things. So if my family does that to her, you can imagine how stressed out she could be sometimes just living with me. <laughs> and I have to be sensitive to that kind of thing. Okay. And on page 327, Dobson mentions an excellent book. Gary Smalley and John Trent wrote a book on the language of love. And those love language things are, th those books that those guys have written are just excellent. And there's a wonderful story there. But see, see, you ladies probably love to read that story on page 327. But I'm going, those books are just really helpful. And then I don't take time to read the story. I just keep going. I just want the principles. Page 3. Where did I go? 331. I'm jumping around here a little bit. How do men and women differ emotionally? And are those differences caused by cultural influence or genetic factors? Okay, now, here, here are men and here are women. Are, do all women and all men clump together emotionally? No, there's a range of differences within each group. So when two people develop a friendship, the range of differences in each of them will have some places where they overlap, but they'll also have some places where they <coughs> clash a little bit. And you just have to work through the clashes. Where you have the overlaps, my daughter showed us a picture of some friends of ours from years ago that got together, and she said, she said, here, you want to see what they look like now? Because we haven't seen these friends for probably 15 years. And we looked and said, Hey, yeah, they look about the same, or uh, they look like they're getting old, or whatever. And and our daughter said, on she's on Facebook, so she said they get together about once a month. Would you like for me to arrange for you to get an invitation? <laughs> and I said, not for me. And Nina goes, not for me. I mean, I like them; they're friends, but we're just kind of. What's the word we use for people who like to stay at home a lot? homebodies we're just kind of get home stay there I get out and come to school so I get all of my out of the house stuff out of my system just coming here and interacting with you guys and going stopping the store on the way home I don't need any other kind of stuff oh and interacting with people at church on Sunday so I'm not looking for any other kind of social interaction in fact in my mind it kind of becomes if you're not careful if they do it every month, that would become like a social obligation. That wouldn't be very pleasant. So I'll just be a homebody. And of course my wife stays at home, but she reads books and she prays for everybody and she just loves staying at home. And enjoys getting out to go to church on Sunday, but other than that, she's just not much inclined to go anywhere. She just likes being at home. So. Basically what it comes down to is you can't make a lot of blanket statements about men and women there I mean some of these some you can't like women are more adept with words than men are and that kind of thing But but you look at the places where you overlap and then where you have friction and say where we overlap Let's uh, enjoy it where we have friction. Let's use it as an opportunity to grow. What does the Bible say? Iron does what? sharpens iron so both of us have strengths. No, if it's my strength and we have a clash over it, it must be her weakness. No, it's two strengths clashing. And once we resolve the clash, both of us are stronger as a result of it. 
page 333, Dobson gives some of these differences. Do you agree with these? Number one on page 332, women have greater vitality. I think my wife would say no, because she says, Tom, it just makes me tired watching you because I'm hyperactive. <laughs> Men have a higher incident of death from almost every disease. Ah. So we're gonna we're more susceptible to disease. Men have a higher rate of basal metabolism. Obviously our skeletal structure is different. Women have larger stomachs, kidneys, livers, and appendix. If my wife were here, she would. If I was reading this to her at home, she'd say TMI. Anyone know what TMI means? Too much information. Too much information. I don't need all of that. So I think, okay, he's telling us some. Oh, because he's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. So this stuff would intrigue him. Where it's like, well, yeah, I know there's those differences, but that's not that big a deal to me. But say, okay, my job is to try to understand the differences and accept them. No, not just accept them, appreciate them and recognize that God made her that way and he brought her into my life for my benefit, to make me a better person, to make me more effective at what I do. Okay, now we're ready for chapter 21, uh, Money Matters, page 336. Is it wrong to be unusually wealthy? Is it wrong for a Christian to be wealthy? No. And what's the verse again? To whom much is given, much is required. You wish somebody, someplace in the world, would die and leave you a million dollars? All of your problems would be solved? Oh. Your school bill would be paid and you wouldn't have to work, right? But at the end of each year, when you file your income tax and your million dollars, made enough in interest for you to live off of and still have some leftover money without spending a million dollars? What's the question you have to answer when you file your taxes? Have I used all this money God has given me in a way that's pleasing to Him? Would you like to be responsible for the distribution of a million dollars or the proceeds from a million dollars every year? See, sometimes, yeah, I think I would. It's like, yeah, well, if you had that, I mean, what does a million dollars produce in a year at 5% interest? Is that $50,000? If you had $50,000 coming in every year from a trust fund, what would you do with it? Whoa! I'd go shopping and buy a closet full of clothes and buy me a new car and da da da. I'd say, wait a minute, I'm thinking maybe you'd be wasting that $50,000. If you could live on 20000 of it, then that means you could be using the other 30000 to help other people in life. You follow the thinking? To whom much is given, much is required. When I file my income tax at the end of the year, I'm just thankful that God got me through another year without going into debt. And uh, I told a guy one time who had quite a bit of money that I said, I said to one friend of mine, he said, Tom, I never find the bargains that you find. I said, you don't need to. You've got enough money just to go in and pay for it. But I don't. So by you paying full price, the guy makes enough money in his business that he can mark stuff down and sell it to me for 10 cents on the dollar at the end of the season. You're not supposed to find bargains because you make big bucks. So he goes shopping and he just spends the money and he enjoys having the money to spend. I go shopping and I find the bargains and I enjoy finding the bargains. Who's having more fun, him or me?
You've never been bargain shopping. You've never walked into a store saying, I need something, but I don't have the money for it. If I'm going to buy it, it's going to have to be 10 cents on the dollar. And you find one over there, sitting someplace without a price on it. And you go, there's no price on this. How much do you want for this? Well, that's our display. Well, are you willing to sell it? It's the perfect color to fit in my house. Well, yeah, you know, it's the end of the season. We'll be getting new displays in. Uh, let me go check. And they come back and say, here's a $500 couch that they're going to sell me for $100. I'm going, well, I don't know. Because, I mean, that's a good deal, but I don't know if I want to spend the whole $100 on that couch. And he says, what if I throw in the chair that matches it to go with it? Whoa, here's my $100. I'll take this stuff home. You understand that? And my wife says, Tom, this stuff happens to us so often, you can't call it just coincidence. And I said, no, you can't. It's just God providing, just like in the wilderness. And, and so, in, so from my perspective, I'm thinking I have more fun. But I know some wealthy people who have a whole lot of fun. I mean, I know a guy who buys and sells shopping centers. And his whole purpose in life is to make enough money that he can support missionaries all around the world. And he spends tons of money on missionaries. And I'm going to tell you, from the conversations I've had with him, he's having as much fun as I am. You follow me? But he's living in a different arena. And his house, <laughs> I mean, his, his fishing boat costs more than the house I live in. But look what he does with all the money that God gives him. So, uh, no, it's not wrong to be wealthy. Uh, whatever God gives you, be a steward of it. Uh, I think on page 338 is where Dobson really gets to the core of this thing. What's the biblical approach to possessions and money? And here's what he says. God owns, principle one, God owns it all. And principle two, and this is a good one. There's always a trade-off. Oh, but the first one's a good one, too. But it all belongs to God. So how I spend it is stewardship before the Lord. And my theory is, at the end of the month, because I use charge cards, because they're so convenient, if I charge more stuff than I can pay for, then that means I spent some money I shouldn't have spent. So I better look at how I'm spending money and make some changes. And since I like to go shopping, if I'm wanting to come, cut back on my expenses, just stay home and don't go shopping. But every Sunday after church, I say to my wife, you want to go out to Red Rack and look for some bargains? Who knows what we might find? And when I say that, she realizes that what I'm saying is, we might find something that's such a good bargain that we won't use it, but if we buy it and keep it at the house, somebody will stop by and need it someday. I actually bought a winter coat one time that was too big for me. But it was so cheap I couldn't pass it up. And I put it in my closet. And Nina said, Tom, it's too big for you. It, it just, it looks sad when you wear that to church, when you wear it to school. Just don't wear it. I'm going, okay. And I said, maybe I just will find someone I can give it to someday. And sure enough, there was a missionary home on furlough when we were living in Illinois. And he was from Brazil where they don't have winter coats. And he said, boy, he said this, he said, I've forgotten how cold the winters get here. And I'm going, I bet you don't have a winter coat. And he said, no, we don't have winter coats in Brazil. And I said, Let, I think, I said, I have one that you can have. He said, I don't think yours will fit me. I said, this one will, because it's too big for me. And sure enough, it fit in perfectly. And I'm going, aha, that's why God had me buy that coat. So I could give it to this missionary. So see, see that mindset? See why my sister says I have a shopping problem? Because I'm always thinking, who could I give that to if I bought it? But, say, you have to say, just stay at home. And, say, and then pray about this stuff. When you, I go look at it, and sometimes I say, Lord, should I buy that? And if I'm not sure about it, and if there's a doubt about it, don't do it. And in the principle, too, there's always a trade-off between time and effort and money and rewards. In, in other words... If you work at a job that produces a lot of income, you probably work a lot of hours every week and your job drains you. If you work at a job that pays minimum wage, you don't have to think much to do it, but then when you're off work, you don't have much money to spend. 
So the guy who has an intense job that pays well, he doesn't have the time or energy to enjoy the fruits of his labors. And the guy who has a minimum job who has lots of time and energy doesn't have the money to support his efforts. Um, I mean, having our daughters in Christian school and being Christian school teachers and paying tuition for them to go to Christian school, they didn't get to go free. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on vacations and all their friends talk about taking vacations. And I said, girls, here's the bottom line. We'll go wherever the camps call us and ask us to come and be the speaker. And we would go to two, probably two to three camps every summer for a week of camp. And our girls got to go free because I was the speaker. But for that week, they would feed us and give us a place to live. And our girls got to enjoy camp. And they were satisfied that that was as good as going on a trip somewhere, going on a vacation. And the third principle, there's no such thing as an independent financial decision. When I spend money for item A, then I don't have that money to spend for something else. When I give money to church, then that money is not available to put someplace else. When I put money in an investment, oh no, you can't take it back from church, but you could pull it out of the investment, couldn't you? <laughs> Years ago, when I was in the insurance business, uh, I had a friend who advised me to make an investment. And I invested some money, and it was in a bad investment, and it didn't make any return. And so after a few years, I thought, you know, this investment doesn't make any more money than I'd be making at the bank where the money's guaranteed. So I took it out of the investment and put it in the bank. And that same year I made that investment with some money was early on in Warren Buffett's career in Omaha. Now, why didn't my friend who told me about making an investment mentioned that I should buy one share of stock from uh, Warren Buffett's Omaha company. You go, one share? If I would have bought a thousand dollars worth of stock way back when, when he first started, that stock that in his company has grown so much, I would be a millionaire today. So what does that tell you? That I got bad advice? No. What that tells you is God didn't intend for me to be a millionaire. You, you follow my thinking? I'm happy to say that if who knows what I would have done, how much money I would have wasted if he'd have made me a millionaire. Because he very well could have just by having someone advise me to buy stock from this company in Omaha before Warren Buffett became famous. Principle number four is really important. It's called, it's on page 339, Delayed gratification is the key to financial maturity. It's also the key to financial success. Is simply saying, I'm going to put off buying it. I'd I really want it bad, but I'll wait till it goes on sale. I'll wait till I can find it someplace on clearance. Which means, by the way, do you know there's certain things that go on sale at certain times of the year? So when do you think I buy my summer clothes? Winter. In the winter time, when the summer clothes are being phased out. And when do I buy my winter clothes? Summertime. In the summertime. You say, well, they're not going to be the latest fashion. You got that right. <laughs> I'm not trying to be fashionable. I'm trying to be a good steward of the money that God has given me. I'm trying to be frugal. Uh, I'm simply saying I'll wait to buy that till later. And I need a new belt. This one's getting, I mean, on the back side it looks pretty ragged, but you can't see it so it doesn't matter. But I'm waiting to buy a new belt <laughs> till Coles sends me a letter that says, hey, we haven't seen you for a while. Here's a $10 gift certificate. Spend it on anything. And then if I don't find something that I find really a good sale, I go over to the belt department and say, do they have my size belt here? And sure enough, they'll usually have just what I need. So I'll just keep wearing this old ragged one until uh, Cole sends me a $10 gift card. And no amount of income, on page 340 he says, will be sufficient if spending is not brought under control. It's not that I need more income, it's need I to control my spending. And if I control my spending, 
in, in fact, I've said this, you can live. When I used to work with high school kids, some of these kids say, really what I want to do is get a high paying job and be a millionaire someday. And I said, you really want to be a millionaire? And they go, yeah. I said, well, that's easy enough. When you get out of high school, get two jobs at two fast food restaurants and live at home with your parents. And within 25 years, that means when you're 45 years old, the money you've earned, since you don't have to spend it, you put every paycheck into investment. You follow me? And in 25 years, you'll have accumulated a million dollars. You'll be 45 years old and a millionaire, if that's what you want. Now, if you're working, what, 60, okay, they won't let you work 40, right? So you're working 64 hours a week and going to church on Sunday. You don't have time for anything else. You, you just work and eat and sleep, and you're at home, so your parents don't make you pay any bills because they're thinking he's going to die someday and I'm going to get his million dollars. And they go, Mr. Bonine, you make it sound terrible. I'm going, I'm thinking some people who make it their goal in life to become millionaires do end up having a terrible life. And I know this, some of the people who want it and don't get it, it really drives them bonkers. Okay, page chapter 22, Families Under Fire. Page 341. Is the traditional family a thing of the past? And he talks about some people in here who talk like the family unit, a father, a mother, and children. And I'm even going to add, and grandparents, and aunts and uncles. That is no longer viable in our culture and our society. And I'm thinking, yes it is. But I have a niece who went to school in Oklahoma at State University, and she was in a sociology class. And the teacher said, how many of you have ever been to a family reunion? And she was the only one that raised her hand. And she said, Emily, you've been to a family reunion? She goes, we have them every year. And, and she goes, well, tell the rest of the class what you do at your family reunions. And so she started describing all the things we do. And people were going, what? And then the instructor said, you know, you are like a person from the past. And here's what her teacher said, that doesn't exist in America anymore. Now, how many of you have ever been to a family reunion? One, two, three, four. Four out of six. What does that tell you? Now, see, Emily was in a classroom with about 35, 40 people in it, and she was one out of 40 in a secular context. Here we are in a Christian context, and four out of six of you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? With a family reunion? Did you get together every year? It was just what you did. And was it a fun time? Well, <laughs> not when people are picking on me and not when people are embarrassing me. But you have those memories of connections with family for the rest of your life. And, and, and Dobson's point is, no, the family, the traditional family, is well and strong. It just doesn't get the publicity that the broken homes do. And, and again, part of this is families used to kind of live close to each other. Now they're spread all over. So it's harder to get together and have family reunions. But you could still do it. You just have to work at it to maintain a traditional family in the world that we live in today. <laughs> Page 347. 344, he makes a neat statement. Millions of husbands and wives today are deeply committed to one another in bonds of affection that will never be shaken. If you go to graduate school, 
don't be surprised if you encounter a professor in some kind of a sociology class. And here's what a professor said. I couldn't believe it. When I was in grad school, when I heard this, he goes, you know, he said, people who believe in, in uh, fidelity in marriage as opposed to infidelity <laughs> are just selfish. I, I go, what did he just say? And he said, and here's what he said. If your spouse is such a wonderful person, you should be willing to share her with other men in the community. <laughs> And I'm going, in my head, this guy is one sick puppy. Because my perception is that fidelity is, is, the, is unselfish. I mean, it's an unselfish commitment to one person. Infidelity is a lot of people just being selfish and indulging their own selfish desires. But, again, I thought, oh, wait a minute. Why should that surprise me? The devil's a liar and the father of lies. So what does he do? He wants to call a lie the truth, and he wants to call the truth a lie. So I'm just saying you're going to hear that stuff. Just be prepared for it and don't let it mess with you. Page 347, I said. Let's turn over to 347. Dr. Dobson talks about people who feel trapped. Do any of you, well, have you lived long enough to have some friends who got married right out of high school? And they've been married five or six years? Okay, people who get married right out of, okay, some of your friends, it, think about this, if you had a friend who got married right out of high school, and then you went off to college, and then you met someone in college, but you worked for a while before you got married. And here you are, 30 years old. Maybe you've been married, what, five years? And you've got a child or two? But they've been married for, you've been married five years, they've been married 15, and they feel trapped because they didn't get to do all the stuff you did. Y you follow that? And Dr. Dobson says, what ha what's going on here? And he says, you know, when people start feeling entrapped by uh, their marital bonds, then what it really indicates is that they've, they're disrespecting their partner. They don't have enough respect for the person they live with. And they're just being too self-centered about the whole thing. And he says, we need to watch out for that. He says on page 348, right in the middle of the page, I believe the majority of divorces can be traced to the twin reactions of disrespect and marital claustrophobia. Feeling locked in. Feeling like I need to get away from this. I need to get out of here. Uh, it's just stressing me out, being so confined. And both of those, and whatever stress you feel in the confines of marriage, <laughs> whatever you do that breaks that bond is going to be more stressful. So just learn to say, hey, I just have to live with this. This is just what's going to happen. And you say, I'll just have to accept that. And, and, and more than anything else, I'm going to make sure I'm being respectful in my heart and mind and in my words to my spouse. Page 353. When my wife left me, for another man, I felt like the whole thing was my fault. And here's what Dr. Dobson says. And often, a woman says, what did I do wrong that he left me? So it's both ways. And Dr. Dobson says in the middle of page 353, the blame for marital disintegration, that's called a broken home, is seldom the fault of the husband or the wife alone. It takes two to make it work, and it usually, the blame can be shared by both people fail to do something to hold this 
everything together. And I know a lot of people don't want to admit that, but uh, I say to people, if you're not happy in your marriage, then ask yourself what you can do. Watch this. If you're not happy in your marriage, I would say to somebody, think of what you can do to make her happier. Well, I'm not here talking about her happiness. I'm here talking about mine. And I'm saying, do any of you know that little thing for joy? What's the key to joy? J stands for? Jesus. Jesus first. O stands for? Others. Others. And Y stands for? You. And you are last in this equation. <laughs> and that's, the, that's a formula for joy that will take you a long way in life. Page 362. We only have today and one more time, and this class is over. So I need to stay on track here. Oh, plus I have to leave at 1030 today to go to a funeral. So, page 362. What would be your recommendations to a young wife and mother whose husband is extremely violent and frequently abuses her and the children? And here's what he says, right in the middle of page 362. You should get her and her kids out of the home immediately. Abuse of spouses and children simply must not be tolerated. It's against the law. And the law must be enforced. No one has to live in an abusive environment today. You agree with that? I mean, if this guy has gone bonkers and he's being abusive, we need to get out of here. Now, this to me is so crazy. But are any of you counseling majors? Okay. Have, have you read any place to where people in abusive situations who are being abused make excuses for the abuser and sometimes think it's their fault. See, there it is. The devil is a liar and the father of lies and he seeks to devour people. And what God intended to be... I tried to find a descriptor one time that would fit a label for what God intended marriage to be. And I found it as I read through Scripture. Are you ready for this? Holy matrimony. And I even smile when I say it because it sounds kind of extraterrestrial or something. But it's like here's this beautiful thing called marriage that God intended that's holy and it's matrimonious. And the devil looks at that and says, destroy it if you can. And in your counseling courses you'll pick up on that and to me that's so sad so probably knowing that happens if you encounter somebody in your life who's in an abusive situation you need to be there to help them to help to do what you can to help rescue them from that abusive situation okay guess what happens if you're available to help the person who has a child whose husband comes home and he's out of control she gets in the car she brings the kids. She comes to your house. She stays overnight because she's afraid to go back home. The phone rings. And guess who's on the phone? The abusive husband. He goes, is my wife at your house? I said, why would she be at my house? Well, if she is, you tell her to come home. Why wouldn't she want to come home? What are you doing that would drive your wife away from your home? Well, are you going to tell me where she is? No. Click. Whoa. A friend of mine said one time, he thought maybe that abusive husband was so out of control and violent that he might show up at his house and do something that would be dangerous to my family. And I'm thinking, you know, probably I have to take that risk if God's brought that person into my life 
because if nobody helps them, I mean, what happens is just sad. So if, if you know of an abusive situation, just volunteer to say, if you need a place to stay, you can come to my house anytime. We'll make room for you and the kids. And if it escalates and the guy's out looking for her, then there are places in town where you can take them where they'll be protected. But it's a sad, sad thing. Page uh, 375. Page 375. What do I have on this page? The Great Marriage Killers. Things that kill marriage. In other words, you know what? It would be, when you're doing your summary for this chapter, it might be a good idea to just make a list of marriage killers so that when you have friends that are married or someday when you get married, you keep it someplace on your computer and say, you know, these are all, this is a big list of things that can kill a marriage. And married people ought to be thinking about it and looking at it. And what's the first one on the list on page 375? There's 12 dragons, he calls them, here in this chapter. And the first one, does anyone have their book on page 375? What's the first one? Overcommitment and physical exhaustion. Overcommitment. Now, and if I'm overcommitted, <laughs> then that also means I'm physically exhausted, right? You better find a balance in life. I used to think that burning the candle at both ends, have you ever heard someone talk about that? That burning the candle at both ends was a noble thing to do. Because there wasn't much time left before the Lord comes back and we have to get it all done as quick as possible. And a good friend of mine said, Tom, while you're out there burning the candle at both ends, you're using the candle up. If God intends to wait a while to come back and has something for you to do, that's longer than the candle you're going to have left, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, here's what he basically said. He says, you're going to burn the candle up, step into heaven, <laughs> and it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I had something for you to do down there. I'm not ready to end this program yet. Whoa! I better quit just focusing on all the work that needs to be done and pour my hyperactive self into it and say, God, of all this work that needs to be done, which things do you want me doing? Even my wife had to say to me when our children were younger, she said, Tom, you have all this ministry with all these teenagers, and that's a good thing, but wouldn't it be a shame to pour your life into all these other people's children and lose your own children because you don't have time for them? Ah! like grab me by the throat because she was right and I said you're right I need to cut back and I had to find some ways to where I have trouble saying no to people so I had to develop some mechanisms for saying no and uh, I found the best way to do that is keep a calendar and put on the calendar all the best things I can do with my time and then when people call and say sorry I'm already booked I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. What's the second thing on the list? Excessive credit and conflict over how money will be spent. Well, my wife and I come from such different backgrounds. What happens when we don't see eye to eye on a financial expenditure? Well, then let's pray about it. Let's talk about it. And let's see if we can work it out as a compromise. But she will never, I'm just telling you, she will never like going into debt. Even to buy a house, her father was a carpenter. So what did he do? While he was living in a rented house, he earned some money and bought some land. Then he bought some lumber and he built the house so he never had a mortgage. He never borrowed money to buy a car. And it's like, whoa! I lived on a farm where we had all this equipment and we borrowed money all the time to buy equipment to do our field work. If we didn't borrow money to buy 
a combine to cut our wheat, we couldn't get the wheat cut. Or you'd have to hire somebody to do it, and that would take most of the profit from the crop. So I just grew, we grew up in a different kind of background, and she will never like spending money. So anytime I'm going to spend money where it means going into debt, I have to lay it all out and explain it to her as to why this is a wise decision. And if she doesn't see it, then okay, we don't do it. But she says, yeah, I see your point. It's just that I grew up in a home where they never did that. I said, I know, that's why I have to take the time to explain it to you and let you get the whole picture in mind. And in fact, the reason we bought a house is I said, Dinah, here's the deal. We can rent for this much money every month or we can buy a house for less than that and eventually own the house, but we'll have to have a mortgage to get it. She goes, I see your point. You see what she'd say? I see your point. She would agree to that, but she never did like having a mortgage. But if we had never had a mortgage to buy a house, we wouldn't be living in a house that's paid for today. We would be doing what? Paying rent for the rest of our lives. So she had to make some adjustments in her thinking, some compromising, and I had to make some compromises to say, I'm not going to buy a house that might appreciate a lot because it would cost too much to rent there. But if I can buy a house in a community where I don't pay as much for it, that's cheaper than renting someplace. Okay, what's the next one? Selfishness. Well, that makes sense. Selfishness. Just being selfish. If you want to be selfish, don't get married. Because that automatically means that you're going to have to prefer your spouse above your own interest. And I guess if you don't have a spouse, then you just decide to get up and go somewhere. You say, Lord, I'm headed off to the mission field here. I'm headed off to do this. I'm headed off to do that. And you just go do it. The next marriage killer on page 376 is unrealistic expectations. So what would be an unrealistic expectation? That my wife and I will never have a disagreement. What could be another unrealistic expectation? Give me some potential unrealistic expectations that single people have about marriage. Would you ever do anything that would make your spouse cry because they were hurt so much? Yes or no? No, I would never do anything. Now, what you mean is, I wouldn't intentionally do something, right? But are you going to do something that will probably make your spouse hurt in their heart severely? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. That's not going to happen. We're going to have a perfect marriage. No, you're not. That's an unrealistic expectation. Space invaders? What? You get in her space? What do you think happens when, uh, okay, now, she's okay with me messing with the pantry because I buy all this food, so I put it in there in an organized way so people who come over can find things. But what if I decide to go organize where she keeps the plates and the cups and the silverware? That's her space. Don't invade it. So where's my space? <laughs> out in the barn, in the pasture, because she doesn't want to go out there for anything. I built a garage right next to the house where I thought I could keep stuff handy, but I found out that that's close enough where she keeps a lot of her stuff there too. So guess what happens? The garage becomes her space. It's actually, she, and she goes, Tom, don't say that. It sounds so bad. It's not your space and my space. It's our space. Micah, I'm just telling you, that's the way she thinks. And I think all the girls are going to think that way with their husbands. And I'm telling you, it is our space. But if I mess with it, I'm invading her space. So I need a space that's far enough away from the house. The trunk of my car, she doesn't mess with that. The back of my pickup that's got a topper on it. I've got some spaces that she doesn't invade. But it isn't like she decides not to invade it. I just keep it away from her. Cause, and, and, here, and you say, what's going on here? I'm going, well, 
she's invading your space. No, you know, Tom, see, she doesn't invade my space. That's not her heart. That's not her makeup. She's a nester. Women build a nest when they get married. I just saw, a, I like watching nature shows. I just saw a nature show recently that was so cool. There's these birds that build these beautiful nests. They work hard to build it to attract a bird to be their mate, and they mate for life. But guess what happens as soon as she decides that this guy is going to be my mate for the rest of my life. He's already built this beautiful little place for us to live, but what does she do as soon as she gets there? She starts rearranging things and fixing it up and making it better. And you just have to remember, she's not invading my space. She's making a nest. Sexual frustration, the green grass of infidelity. See, now there's a lie. Infidelity is not green grass. Infidelity is poison. Read the book of Proverbs. Infidelity is poison that destroys a person's soul. Now, this is interesting on page 376. A business collapse or a business success. Being too successful or being a failure can... Uh, kill a marriage. Getting married too young. Alcohol and abusive substances. Pornography, gambling, and other addictions. Wow. Wow. I mean, just make a list of marriage killers and say, these things are killing marriages all over the place. Page 386. Where did it go? Page 386. I know that for the sake of my marriage and family, I should not overcommit myself. But we attend a church that schedules activities and events six or seven nights a week. My husband and I are asked and expected to accept leadership in many of these functions. Frankly, I feel guilty if I don't do what my pastor asked me to do. As a result, we have very little time together as a family. How do we accommodate these competing needs? Okay, now the pastor has all this work at church he wants done. And he wants the most qualified people doing it, so he's going to tap you. You got that? You have a family. Is the pastor thinking first about your family or first about all this ministry stuff that he needs done? Now, if he stops to think about it, he's going to think about your family, right? And he's going to say, now, don't overcommit yourself because you need to take care of your family. But, can you do this for me this next week? Because I really need your help. You're the best qualified person. You understand? He's going to tell you to watch out for your family, but he's going to ask you to do something. So he just told me. He wants me to do something, but he told me to watch out for my family. Now, if I follow my pastor's advice, what do I do? I help him run a good program, or I watch out for my family. And sometimes, here's what you have to say. And Dobson talks about this. You have to say no I can't do that because I've committed that time and that energy to my family. You just have to learn to say no. And, and the way to say it is say, my family, I have to carve out time in my life for my family or I won't be fit to do ministry. And how much each family needs is different, so a guy has to sort that out. And Dr. Dobson talks about that. He talks about all things he was doing but then he says in the middle of page 387, there's always more good things to do than uh, any one person can do. I need to maintain a healthy balance between, he calls it Christian duty. I'm going to call it between Christian service, between work responsibility, between recreation, between social obligations, and between meaningful family life. Well, I got five things going on here at once, and I have to make sure I don't overlook my family. 
And of all the five things that the Bible talks about, which of these five things has he made my first responsibility after I take care of my relationship with him? I mean, read through the Bible and see all the things he calls people to do and then see what he says about the family. And what you'll conclude is that my family is my responsibility before God and nobody else is going to watch out for my family. My wife and I are going to have to make decisions that are in the best interest of our children's well-being. And we're the only ones watching out for it because we're the ones that God told to watch out for it. The rest of them have other things that they're looking at and trying to take care of. Okay, as I said, I need to get out of here and go to a funeral because somebody expects us to be there and I don't want to disappoint grieving people. <laughs>